Hello, everybody. So we're back with Patriots History. This is a little unusual. I'm taping this one because we had some medical emergencies and some dog medical emergencies and things got messed up. So probably in the near future, what's going to happen is I'm going to pre-tape these and uh, post them at or before 12 o'clock Eastern. So check in. I might have them done earlier in the day from now on. Uh, doing them live kind of causes problems for a lot of reasons, um, not the least of which is this way I can use Zoom and uh, not have to worry about the OBS stuff. This is all inside baseball. You don't need to know that. But anyway, just, just so you know, uh, this is going to be taped and probably Friday and maybe from then on we'll, we'll do taping of these, which won't change what I'm covering or won't change the emphasis or anything else. All right. So what we are doing is uh, reading through Patriots History of the United States. Make sure you have the 15th anniversary edition. You can use other editions. <clears throat> Excuse me, still have a little hangover of a cold. You can use other editions, but you're not going to get the uh, exact page number sometimes. It'll be pretty close, and the header should be pretty much the same, but there may be a few differences. So if you can, try to use the 15th anniversary edition. Okay. And we were in chapter two, colonial adolescence. And we had started last time, um, we'd ended up on page 49, the origins and evolution of slavery. And I had just gotten to page 50 and the first full paragraph. So we will start on page 50 with the first full paragraph. White Virginians did not come to America with the intention of owning either English or African slaves, yet that was precisely what they did. Between 1619 and 1707, slow, uh, slavery slowly became entrenched and thereafter became almost entirely racial in its character. Now again, I'm a historian, and so I'm covering swaths of time of 20, 30, 40, 50 years sometimes in a sentence. It was a slow process in America, yet, historically speaking, it was very fast, okay? <clears throat> Before then, the lines were muddled. Until 1670, Black Virginians could own white slaves, and as late as 1860, Black Virginia and South Carolina freedmen owned African slaves. Opportunities in the economically diverse Northeast proved much more attractive to immigrants than the staple crop agriculture of Virginia and Carolina is making for permanent labor shortages in the South. Increasingly, it became more difficult to persuade white indentured servants or Indian workers to harvest the labor-intensive tobacco and rice crops. This was hard physical labor best performed in gang systems under the supervision of an overseer. Now, last time I went over the feedback loops in land, when I discussed this paragraph, which I read last time, but I wanted to reread that. <clears throat> and let me just really briefly uh, review the feedback loop in land. And the feedback loop in land is this. People came into the Northeast and land was abundant. So abundant land meant that wages were high because if you didn't like what someone was paying you, you could take off and, and go further west and start your own farm. As I said at the time, the Johnny Paycheck song, take this job and shove it, I ain't working here no more. So with wages high in the north, uh, businesses, particularly those with industry, but also farming and agriculture, sought to substitute what economists call capital for labor. Simply put, they tried to use machines to do human labor whenever possible. Of course, um, making and utilizing machines requires skills, and skilled labor demands high wages, which meant that you had a feedback loop in the north of increasingly high wages because of the availability in land. So you say, well, the south had lots of land. They did, but there's something a little bit different going on. In the south, they had an inheritance structure known as primogenitor, which meant that the land was inherited by the eldest son only. 
the land was not divided among all the sons. Um, that is called partible inheritance, which was prominent in the north. See? So in the north, not only was land available, but uh, daddy could only pass down the land to so many kids before it was divided beyond the point of being sustainable, which is generally considered to be 50 acres, 40 or 50 acres. So in the north, uh, younger sons continually, uh, or all sons continually move further west as the land was being divided to the point that they couldn't farm it anymore. But in the south, because of primogenitor, the plantation continued in its present form and even gained land as, as sons would acquire more land. Thus, the land sections became larger and larger and larger, and they depended heavily on uh, cash crops as opposed to crops you could eat, such as corn or wheat, um, uh, rice. So as a result, you had tobacco at first, and then later cotton being the main crops in the South. So those were labor intensive um, crops and they required a lot of farm hands and you couldn't afford them um, in, in the South because <clears throat> they'd just go North. So increasingly the Southerners relied on slave labor. And we'll later when we get closer to the Civil War get into a big um, his historical debate about how efficient slave labor was and whether or not it was profitable. But believe me, these guys thought it was profitable or they wouldn't have used it the way they did. So this in part, cash crop and primogenitor explains why the South veered heavily toward slavery while the North veered heavily toward free farms and free men. All right, next paragraph. Yet why did tobacco and rice planters specifically turn to African slaves? So I'm going to get into that here. In retrospect, one must conclude that Africans were more vulnerable to enslavement than white indentured servants and Indians. The African Gold Coast was open to exploitation by European sea powers and already had a flourishing slave trade with the Muslims. This trade was far more extensive than previously thought and involved far more Europeans than earlier scholars had acknowledged. There's a book I recommend, very scholarly academic book called White Cargo, but also one of the great historians of slavery admits this over and over again, and he is David Brian Davis of Yale, and he's got a whole slew of books, and they all begin the same way. The problem of slavery in, problem of slavery in the age of the revolution, the problem of slavery in the age of enlightenment, on and on and on, and Davis points out that white slavery was incredibly common, especially prior to the settlement of the Americas, and was carried out heavily by Muslims using black middlemen, i.e. chiefs, to enslave their own people and or other tribes and bring them to the coast for exchange. All right. Thanks to this existing trade in human flesh, there were already ample precedents of black slavery and structures to manage in the British West Indies. More important, those African slaves shipped to North America truly became captives. They did not initially speak English, Spanish, French, or Indian languages and could not communicate effectively outside their plantations. Uh, we could add that the tribes were deliberately mixed up to further impede uh, communication. Even before they were shipped across the Atlantic, traders mixed slaves by tribe and language with others with whom they shared nothing in common except skin color, isolating them further. The first generation of slave captives thus became extremely demoralized and rebellion became infrequent. Even as the paranoia over slave revolts constantly gripped plantation white. So we have this this uh, paradox that whites in the South increasingly all the way up to the Civil War became more and more concerned about slave revolts, while in fact slave revolts were fewer and fewer uh, because of increased slave codes and all sorts of laws being changed, so on and so forth. How could these English colonists so steeped in the Enlightenment principles of liberty and constitutionalism 
enslave other human beings? The answer is harsh and simple. <clears throat> British colonists convinced themselves that Africans were not really human beings in the same manner that they themselves were. Rather, they were property and thus legitimate subjects for enslavement within the framework of English liberty. Into English folk belief was interwoven fear of the color black, associating blackness with witchcraft and evil, while so-called scientists in Europe argued that blacks were an inferior species of humans. English ministers abused the Bible, misinterpreting stories of Cain and Abel and Noah's son Ham to argue for a separate creation and alleged God imposed inferiority on blacks as the curse of Ham. When combined with perceived economic necessity, English racism and rationalization for enslavement of African people became entrenched. Just a word about the mark of Cain and the curse of Ham. Um, the curse of Ham, some of these ministers alleged, was black skin. There's a problem there, and that is that while uh, Noah cursed his sons, God had already blessed Noah and his sons. And God trumps Noah. So whatever God said stands and whatever man says falls. Uh, so it doesn't matter how much you curse somebody who's been blessed. That's why I argue that it's, it's best not to say anything about ministers. If you don't agree with certain ministers, leave them alone. Because chances are at some point, maybe not now, but at some point, point they were ordained and blessed by God. And so it's better just to leave that in the hands of God. Um, same thing with the Mark of Cain, which, where he says, you shall be a, a servant to your, your brothers and so forth. Um, there is no indication that the Mark of Cain was black skin. Um, and uh, there is no indication that all of Cain's children were to be enslaved as well. So <clears throat> ministers took extreme liberties, mixing up these two different uh, events. Um, you remember Ham was cursed because he uh, looked upon his father naked. Naked. Um, so, um, in other words, you get where you're going in this line of thought only by terribly abusing scripture. There is no indication that God cursed any race of people, let alone change the color of their skin to make them more identifiable as slaves, let alone consign them to permanent slavery. Uh, St. Paul said we are, uh, we are all equal, bond and free, man and woman, right? So uh, even if that had been the case at some time in the past, which was not the case, it changed with Jesus. And so it changed with, with Paul's dictum that we're all free, all the same. So, um, but I just want to warn you that is coming up by some of these ministers that they're going to try to use this. Okay, page 51, first full paragraph. <clears throat> Black slavery's institutionalization began in Virginia in 1619 when a small group of black slaves arrived. The term slave did not appear in Virginia law for 50 years. And there is evidence that even the earliest Africans brought over against their will were viewed by some as indentures. Free blacks. Well, wait, how did free blacks get here? Free blacks are identified in public records as early as 1621, that is two years after the slaves arrived from the West Indies. And of the 300 Africans recorded as living in the South through 1640, many gained freedom through the expiration of indenture contracts. Again, another piece of evidence that early slaves were not thought to be hereditary or perpetual slaves but rather they were indentures whose contracts would be worked off. Not all, but there is evidence in the law that many saw it this way, including many judges. Some free blacks soon became landholders, planters, and even slaveholders themselves, and one was elected to the Maryland legislature. <clears throat> but at some point in the mid-17th century, the process whereby all blacks were presumed to be slaves took root, and this transformation is still not well understood. Scholars such as Peter Colchin to isolate race 
I'm sorry, attempts by scholars such as Peter Colchin to isolate race begs the question of why whites permitted any blacks to be free. If it's all about race, if it's all racism, 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 there wouldn't have been any black freedmen anywhere, anytime. But there were a lot. Um, whereas Edmund Morgan's explanation of slavery stemming from the efforts by poor whites to create another class under them is also unpersuasive. Morgan's book is called American Slavery, American Freedom. It's very good. It's one of those I recommend strongly alongside David Bryan Davis, alongside White Cargo. Uh, but uh, his argument is, well, things just changed and, and poor whites needed somebody to look down on. That's kind of his explanation for why perpetual slavery took root. And that doesn't explain things either. Uh, I think we have to say, as of now, it's unexplained. Certainly, the 1619 Project doesn't explain any of this, because as we've said, the 1619 Project deals with Virginia and Jamestown and has nothing to do with the four pillars of American exceptionalism. It may have to do with private property and later with free markets, but it doesn't have to do with the two most important pillars, which were a bottom-up religion of Puritanism and Protestantism and a bottom-up common law system whereby people elect or select their own rulers. That was not present in Jamestown, was not present in the Virginia colony until the formation of the House of Burgesses, also in 1619. So you can take the 1619 project and drop it in a croaker sack, as my rock and roll buddies used to say. <laughs> However, it occurred by 1676, this is a long time from 1619, right? Widespread legalized slavery appeared in Maryland, Virginia, and the Carolinas, and within 30 years, slavery was established an established economic institution throughout the Southern and, to a smaller degree, Northern American colonies. Northern colonies did allow slavery, especially up until about the time of the Revolution. Now, they began to get rid of it soon thereafter. Uh, first by saying it was not hereditary, and then second by simply abolishing it. Um, but the South, of course, hangs on to it. <clears throat> English, Dutch, and New England merchant seamen traded in human flesh. West African intertribal warfare produced abundant prisoners of war to fuel this trade. Prisoners found themselves branded and boarded onto vessels of the Royal African Company and other slavers. On the ship, slaves were shackled together and packed tight in the hold, eating, sleeping, vomiting, defecating while chained in place. Disgusting, horrible stuff. The arduous voyage of three weeks to three months was characterized by a 16% mortality rate and occasionally involved suicides and mutinies. You might remember that the Amistad case was a case of um, African slaves engaged in a mutiny. Finally, at trips in, slavers delivered their prisoners on the shores of America. <clears throat> so let's be clear, because I know some liberals have trouble with clarity. Our book does not in any way downplay, minimize, or excuse human slavery. White, black, brown, yellow, any, all slavery is bad. Slavery was everywhere in the world when slaves arrived in America. Slavery was not unusual to America. What was unusual to America? Freedom. Bottom-up church governance, bottom-up civil governance. That's what was unusual. So if you're going to talk about American exceptionalism, might as well not even mention slavery because there's nothing exceptional about it. Exceptional means stands out. Nothing about slavery in America stood out. It was the same as everywhere else in the world, a little more mild than some places, much worse than other places. It all depends. But there's nothing exceptional about slavery. It was the norm. Okay. Every American colony's legislators enacted laws called Black Codes to govern what some would later call America's peculiar institution. Let me just note the term black codes is a generic code at this time, a generic term 
But after the Civil War in the reconstructed South, black codes would have a separate special meaning. They were actual laws that addressed freed blacks. These codes defined African Americans as chattels personal, movable personal property, not as human beings. And as such, slaves could not testify against whites in court, nor could they be killed for most capital crimes. They were too valuable. Black codes forbade slave literacy, gun or dog ownership, travel, excepting through special travel permits, gatherings numbering more than six slaves and sex between black males and white women called miscegenation. Often teaching blacks the Bible was also prohibited. However, as the development of large mulatto population attests, white men were obviously free to have sex with or more often rape black women. All of the above laws were open to more broad interpretation and variation, especially in the northern colonies. This fact did not alter the overall authoritarian and inherently brutal structure of the peculiar institution. And if you don't know what that means, I defined it earlier, slavery. The vast majority of slaves in the New World worked in either Virginia tobacco fields or South Carolina rice plantations. Rice plantations constituted the worst possible fate. For Carolina lowlands proved to be hot, humid, and horrible work environment, replete with swarms of insects and innumerable species of worms. Huge all-male Carolina workforces died at extraordinary rates. Conditions were so bad that a few Carolina slaves revolted against their masters, again, these are unusual, in the Cato Conspiracy of 1739, which saw 75 slaves kill 30 whites before fleeing to Spanish Florida. White militiamen soon killed 44 of the revolutionaries. A year later, whites hanged another 50 blacks for supposedly planning insurrection in the infamous Charleston plot. Slave revolts and runaways proved exceptions to the rule. Most black slaves ensured their fate in stoic and heroic fashion by creating a lifestyle that sustained them and their will to endure slavery. In the slave quarters, blacks returned from the fields each day to their families, church, and religion. Again, marriage was not permitted in many places. And a unique folk culture with music, dance, medicine, folk tales, and other traditional lore. Blacks combined African customs with Anglo and Celtic American traits to create a unique African American folk culture. Although this culture did not thoroughly emerge until the 19th century, it started to take shape in the decades before the American Revolution. African American traditions, music, and a profound belief in Christianity helped the slaves survive and sustain their hopes for, quote, a better day coming. Let me just note, though, that my co-author, Mike Allen, has done a number of studies on Southern music and Celtic, Anglo-Celtic, Irish influences in rock and roll. And he argues strongly that rock and roll was not just Black-inspired, that it was a combination of Black and white Celtic culture that formed rock and roll, another of those modern liberal myths takes nothing away from Black people to say that they weren't alone in creating rock and roll. Silly. A few statistics clarify these generalizations. Uh, no, wait, sorry. <clears throat> One paragraph up. Still on page 52. Although the institution of slavery thoroughly in, insinuated itself into Southern life and culture in the 1600s, it took the invention of the cotton gin in the 1790s to fully entrench the peculiar institution. Tobacco and rice, important as, though, as they were, paled in comparison to the impact of cotton agriculture on the phenomenal growth of slavery. But the tortured political and religious rationale for slavery had matured well before then, making its entrenchment a certainty in the South. <clears throat> Let me just say a word about I mentioned that these laws of chattel personal were all over the South. They were colonial laws. Later, they would be state laws. You know what they are not? They are not national laws. It is not in the Constitution. Slavery, I'll go over this in detail later, is not in the Constitution. Rather, the phrase is unfree 
persons. Now, liberals are going to say, well, that didn't make any difference. It makes all the difference in the world. The fact is the founders viewed slaves in the Constitution as people, not property. And that is critical because from 1789 until 1860, the steady movement was freedom, national, slavery, local. Why? Because the Constitution said slaves were people. And so if slaves are people, it's only a matter of their um, servitude status with their masters. It's not a perpetual condition. You couldn't treat them like cattle, for example. So this is going to be a very important theme as I continue to go through this in the coming weeks. A few statistics clarify these generalizations. By the mid-1700s, Americans imported approximately 7,000 slaves from Africa and the Caribbean annually. Some 40% of Virginians and 66% of all South Carolinians in 1835 were Black. <clears throat> of these, probably 95% were slaves. By 1763, between 15 and 20% of all Americans were African Americans free and slave, a larger per capita black population than in modern day America. Yet 90% of all these African Americans resided south of the Pennsylvania line, what we would later call the Mason-Dixon line. Southern sla Northern slavery, always small because the absence of a staple crop was shriveling in its death accelerated by Northern reformers who passed manumission acts. That's Freedom Acts, beginning late in the 1700s and by the formation in 1775 of the world's first abolitionist group, the Quaker Anti-Slavery Society by Pennsylvania Quakers, a full eight years before the famed William Wilberforce in England began his anti-slavery crusade. So again, Americans lead the way in freedom. Other Northerners routinely freed their slaves or allowed them to buy their own freedom so that by 1830, there were only 3,000 slaves left in all the North compared to the more than 2 million in the South. When individual initiative did not suffice, Northerners employed the law. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787, the first large-scale prohibition of slavery by a major nation in history, again, we led the way, would forbid slavery above the Ohio River, and the Constitution would allow abolition of the slave trade in 1807. Again, I should add, the Constitution uses the term unfree persons or persons in servitude, not property. <clears throat> Some Northerners envisioned and prayed for an end to American slavery, as did a number of Southerners. George Washington would free all of his slaves following his death, Jefferson and Madison would not. They privately decried slavery as, quote, a necessary evil, something their fathers had come to depend upon, but not something they were proud of or aimed to perpetuate. That's important, okay? So, well, they were still slaves, you know, but it's important that they were at least going that far. Jefferson, Jefferson's commitment to ending slavery may be more suspect than Washington's, or certainly Franklin's, and evidence success that Jefferson would have been close to bankrupt if he had freed his slaves. But virtually all these men believed that slavery would someday end and often delayed confronting it in hopes that it would just go away. And in this, you can't blame them. I mean, okay, I'm going to give, the, I'm not making equivalents. I'm just trying to sh give an example. Social Security. Most people today, would say social security is bankrupt or going bankrupt, needs to be fixed, can't continue the way it's going, it's going to be out of money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But nobody wants to raise the age limit to get social security or to increase social security taxes. Everybody knows it. Everybody admits it. You could have a conversation with 10 people. Hey, social security solvent, nah, not in the long run. But Nobody wants to take the pain right now to get rid of it. Why? They hope it'll just fix itself. Many at this time hope that slavery would just go away, okay? That something would happen, it would just go away. Nobody wanted to deal with the consequences of actually 
freeing people, which are staggering. Um, until the invention of the cotton gin, their hope was not necessarily a futile one. After the advent of the cotton kingdom, however, increasingly fewer Southerners criticized slavery and the pervading philosophy about it slowly shifted from its presence as a necessary evil to a belief that slavery was a positive good. So they convinced themselves in the South that, oh, gee, slavery is actually a good thing. And we will get to eventually a guy that nobody, no liberal ever wants to talk about or quote, which is um, George Fitzhugh, <clears throat> who says that slavery was the perfect form of communism. He had read Marx and he says, you know, this guy Marx, he's on to something. It's really good stuff. But hey, we got we got communism here. It's called slavery. All right. Uh, I can do the next section as well. O Oglethorpe's Georgia. This is page 53. Unlike the Puritans who wanted to create a city on a hill or the Virginia Company, which sought profit, the founders of Georgia acted out of concern for Spanish power in the southern era area of America. Although Queen Anne's War ended in 1713, Spain still represented a significant threat to the Carolinas. General James Oglethorpe, a military hero, also had a philanthropic bent. He had headed an investigation of prisons and expressed special concern for debtors who, by English law, could be incarcerated for their obligation. One of the stupidest ideas in Western history that somebody can't pay a debt, you put them in jail. Oh, yeah, they're really going to be able to pay a debt from jail. What, making license plates? Come on, man. <laughs> if he could open a settlement south of the Carolinas, he could offer a new start to poor English and settle a region that could stand as a buffer to Spanish power. In 1732, Oglethorpe received a grant from King George II for land between the Savannah and Alamala rivers, Oglethorpe and his trustees deliberately limited the size of their land holdings to encourage density and thus better defense. Debtors and prisoners were released on the condition that they immigrate to Georgia. They helped found the first fortified town on the Savannah River in 1733. The trustees, though, had planned well by encouraging artisans, tradesmen, farmers, and other skilled workers from England and Scotland to immigrate. Quite different than Jamestown, right? In addition, they all welcomed all religious refugees to the point of allowing a small group of Jews to locate in Georgia, except Catholics fearing they might ally with the Spanish. So that was not anti-religious, it was political. Within a decade, Britain's fears of Spanish aggression proved well-founded. The European War of Austrian Secession, 1740 to 48, spawned conflict in the Western Hemisphere when Spain and France allied with Indian tribes to attack the British. During the 1739-42 to War of Jenkins' Ear, it actually started when a guy had his ear cut off, General Oglethorpe led Georgian, Georgians and South Carolinians into Spanish Florida to thwart a Spanish invasion. <clears throat> they enjoyed mixed results but failed to wrest St. Augustine from Spain. Despite limited military success, Oglethorpe soon found that his colonists wanted to limit his power. Former convicts actively opposed his ban of rum. Sobriety, they believed, was not going to expedite their rehabilitation. Planters chafed at his prohibition of slavery. In 1750, Georg Georgians repealed the ban on slavery, importing nearly 10,000 Africans by 1770. One year before its original charter expired, Oglethorpe's group surrendered control and Georgia became a royal colony. So again, it's, it's ruled from England. It's not bottom up. With the stabilization of Georgia as the 13th American colony, the final American adjustment to empire was complete. Britain's colonies spanned the entire Atlantic seaboard and the system appeared relatively sound. At the same time, on paper, the mercantile apparatus of the 1600s seemed to function satisfactorily. The king and parliament handed down laws to the secretary of state, who, with the board of trade, issued orders for commerce and governance of the new world. Britain deployed a small network of royal governors, officials, and trade and customs officers who were directed to carry out these laws. Again, though, in the north, there was a tremendous culture 
of bottom-up governance. And, well, we approve of this governor, but we're, we won't keep him if we don't like him. Ultimately, it would be up to these officials to prevent the American Revolution, a challenge well beyond them. The most common thread that connected the British colonies was their governmental structure. Eleven colonies had an appointed council, an elected assembly with a franchise or voting rights bestowed on adult white male property owners. Ten colonies had a governor selected by the king. In the case of the royal colony or by the directors of the joint stock company, the legislators right to vote on taxes, governor's salary and all other revenue measures, the coveted power of the purse constituted a central part of the rights of Englishmen that the colonists enjoyed. So they were already employing the power of the purse. As they grew more prosperous, wealth permeated through the greater part of the body politic, making inevitable the ascendancy of the legislative bodies over executives. This is the Whig theory of government. Despite resistance from the governors, virtually all American colonies in 1770 had seen the elected legislative bodies supersede the governor's offices, wresting almost all important decision-making power from the king's proxies. Isn't that amazing? This is by 1770, Americans had become largely self-governing. American Whigs clung to, to and radicalized the distrust of power that Puritans had displayed in the English Civil War and Glorious Revolution. <clears throat> Colonists distrusted appointed governors and held them at bay with the economic power of the lower house of the legislature and its budgetary appropriation powers. If a governor proved uncooperative, the legislature might hold back his salary to uh, foster compromise. Separated from the mother country by 3,000 miles and beholden to the legislatures for their pay, most governors learned how to deal with the provincials on their own terms. But colonial governments were not balanced governments in any sense. Elected representatives commanded disproportionate power rather than the equal balance of power between branches of English that English Whigs desired. At the same time, a separation of powers was clearly visible if imperfectly weighed in favor of the legislature. So that's where we'll stop for today, but it's easy to see that common law was already permeating up through virtually all of the colonies by 1770, even those that had royal governors. Uh, so th this is very different from any other country anywhere in the world. Nobody else had common law from their birth, and only England had it later. All right. With that said, I'm going to say goodbye until uh, Friday. I'm probably going to tape Friday's show as well. It will appear around 12 o'clock noon as though we're live. And remember, uh, this is brought to you by the wild world of history back here. Um, we have history curricula for high schoolers with teacher's guide, student guide videos. I teach every lesson in video, all 22 chapters of Patriots history with all sorts of background and visuals and maps and charts. And we have a full course in world history as well. If you're interested in that from 1775 to the present and all the big names are there, Gandhi, Churchill, Marx, um, uh, Robespierre, Napoleon, Hitler, they're all there. Um, also, we're trying to turn Patriots history into a video series. So here's how you can help. You can go on the website and wildworldhistory.com and watch the trailer for Patriots history. And if you like it, buy Larry a coffee. The coffee's five bucks. You can buy me more than one. I'll take all the I'll drink all the coffee you can supply. I've had people buy four or 500 coffees. So uh, just feel free to buy me a coffee. Um, and it will go straight to the proceeds to make Patriots history into a, a video. Um, so with that, I will see you guys on Friday.